Hey everybody, what's up? I'm Bianca. And I'm Kiara with the Ambrosia Twins. And welcome back to our YouTube channel. So for today's video, we are gonna be interviewing the author of the BNC Book Club pick, Tell Me A Few Things, Julie Buxbaum. Now this has been two months in the making, but some other stuff has came in the way, but now we have some time, we gotta reread it, we have some questions to ask her, and we are so excited to talk with her today. Hey everybody, so right now, oh my God, this is so crazy to think about, but we are sitting with Julie Buxbaum, the author of Tell Me Three Things. This book is one of my favorite books of all time. So the fact that I get the opportunity to talk with her and ask her some questions about this book is like mind blowing. So first of all, how are you? How are you doing? What is going on? I am okay. I am currently on a mini vacation in Palm Springs at an Airbnb. Um, and it was very, 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 very nice to get out of my house after being literally trapped in there for an entire year. Um, how am I doing? You know, my family's safe. We're fed. We're housed. I cannot complain. Yeah. But it is a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. So first of all, I just want to ask, what was your inspiration to write this book? So Tell Me Three Things, I think, is probably my most personal book. Um, it basically combines the worst thing that ever happened to me with one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, so for those of you who haven't read Tell Me Three Things, it's the story of a girl who shortly after the death of her mother, her dad quickly remarries a woman he met on the internet and moves her from middle-class Chicago to fancy pants LA where she has to start all over and sort of blend into this new step family. Um, and she's wearing all the wrong clothes and saying all the wrong things and an anonymous boy reaches out and helps her navigate her way through the new, her new school and sort of drama and romance ensue, right? So in real life, um, I lost my mom around the same age at 14. And so I sort of took those feelings from the worst thing that ever happened to me and combined it with one of the best. I once received an anonymous email, just like Jesse does and tell me three things that kind of fundamentally changed the course of my life. Um, not in exactly the way that it happens in tell me three things, <laughs> but in the way that something big and delightful happened. Um, and so I wanted to go, and when, you know, when you get an anonymous email, which is such a random weird thing to happen, of course you're gonna use that for a book, right? I'm a novelist, how could I not borrow that for, for my work? Um, and so I combined those two things and that's where Tell Me Three Things came from. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Wow, that's so fascinating. I didn't, I, I didn't know that you actually received an anonymous email. I like did. That sounds like the perfect, like, that's the rom perfect. Com. Yeah. And like it an is. emotional rom com. It like, is. well, it is. <laughs> it didn't, it did, exactly. It didn't happen in high school. For me, it happened after I graduated from law school. Hmm. But yeah, it happened. It was the strangest, most wonderful, bizarre thing. Um, I still have not found out who sent that email. And I never actually want to know. Because um, in my mind, you know, it's George Clooney and Brad Pitt and <laughs> Hemsworth Brothers or whoever, they're all put together. Um, my husband claims he did not send it. And if he did, he better not ever tell me. And he has to carry that to his grave because I will be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was this really magical thing. And it changed sort of how I moved through the world and how I thought of myself. I never thought of myself as someone who would ever be noticed. And it was kind of this weird secret admirer thing. Um, and it was really magical. So how is Tell Me Three Things different from your other books? I mean, I think all of my books, well, until recently, most of my books have delved into um, mother loss and grief. Tell Me Three Things, I think, relies a little bit more on, it, it's, so all of my books sort of have this thematic undertone, which relates to something I'm questioning in my own life. I'm not sure if Tell Me Three Things represents something I was questioning my own life, but I do think it looks at communication and all the different ways we talk to each other and how it affects how we're able to communicate. So I've always been someone who communicates by writing as opposed to speaking out loud. When I was a kid and I'd be angry at my parents, I'd literally write these long angry notes and slip them under their door as opposed to yelling and screaming. And even now when I get mad at my husband, I'll send him an email. Um, as opposed to just like getting it all out. Cause when I get it all out, I tend to cry and crying doesn't help. Right. I want to, yeah. it doesn't. And it hurt. Like I, there's nothing wrong with crying and getting out your emotions, but I want to articulate my feelings and writing is the way I'm able to distill my thoughts. And so I think, tell me three things because they're communicating in two different ways in, in real life and on the page or virtually, I guess, not really on a page, but through words written. Um, 
I wanted to explore how that changes connection. And I think, so I think that's my only book I can think of that really looks at that. Um, when my husband and I first started dating about maybe like a week or two after our first date, he got mono and he was in bed for a month and I couldn't go visit him because it was finals time in law school and I was too scared of getting sick. And so we spent the whole time on the phone, communicating on the phone. And I don't know if we would have fallen in love and started dating had we not had sort of the intimacy of phone where you get like you lose the awkwardness of in-person and like the social anxiety. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in that. And I think it's actually really relevant right now because of the pandemic where we can't see people, but we're relating through Zoom and on the phone and through text messages. Um, and I do think it allows us to jump to a, a greater level of intimacy that wouldn't necessarily happen in face-to-face. -face. Yeah. When you're looking at someone, there's something so much more I don't know, intimate, but also scary. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're more likely to share our deepest thoughts. At least I know I'm more likely to share my deepest thoughts through a text than through a phone call or if through an in-person coffee. Oh. Are you guys that way too? Or is it just me? I get definitely like a lot of social anxiety when I have to talk to someone. I mean, if it's like my best friend, then like, obviously like, I don't really care. But like when I meet someone new, it's like, oh, like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that over text, you like take the time to say your thoughts in the right way. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't come across like in the wrong way? Like if that made sense. So like, I totally agree with, especially what she goes through. Like there's a lot of social anxiety and awkwardness that she's new to this school and she doesn't like, she's trying to adjust to this new lifestyle. So definitely you experience this and you can definitely relate to this as someone who experiences social anxiety. But I want to know what was the most challenging part of writing Tell Me Three Things? I think the emotional aspect, you know, I had written a lot about mother loss, um, but I had written it all from, so my previous books before Tell Me Three Things were all adult. I had two adult books and since Tell Me Three Things, I've written only YA. But when I transitioned to write Tell Me Three Things, it was the first time I went back to when I lost my mom and sort of the experience of sort of the visceral experiences in the first few years after that loss, which is a very different exploration, right? Than, you know, 15 years later, which is what um, my very first book, The Opposite of Love is about. It's sort of about the long hand of grief. And Tell Me Three Things is about like the immediate aftermath and the way it fundamentally changes you. And so Tell Me Three Things required me to go back to that time which was not a time I'd like to visit, I'll be honest. It was such a, it was probably the hardest time in my entire life. I mean, not probably, it definitely was the hardest time in my entire life. And so to have to sort of go back and unpack those feelings and have my, and when you're writing a character, you sort of feel what they feel, right? You sort of step into them. And so I had to sort of go back and relive some of that. I mean, Jessie is not me. She is so much cooler <laughs> and, and more poised and more graceful than I have ever been. Um, but I did have to sort of relive some experiences that I didn't necessarily want to. I like to think it was healing, um, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> like, I feel like we lie and say it is as writers to sort of justify our, you know, our unearthing of emotion. Um, but maybe it is. I don't know. That seems really challenging. And, you know, you really made this book like so emotional. Like it's funny. It's happy it's romantic it's like harder but it also has like a couple like towards the beginning you really see how jesse's handling things and especially when she moves to la with theo and her dad and her new stepmom rachel so i i felt emotional reading this book mm -hmm. like you you definitely you definitely made people cry like you did <laughs> you definitely made and i cried when cry. i finished this too i was like a whole mess <laughs> so what was your favorite scene to write out of the entire book that's a good question. Um, I mean, I love, love, love writing the squeeze scenes, you know, like I love kisses and all that stuff. Um, I'm not going to spoil it, but there is a, a an ending that I really felt like I didn't know. I knew where the book was going, but I did not know how I was going to sort of bring it to crescendo, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so funny. I don't speak music. I don't even know if that's the right word, but I think it is. Yeah. Um, anyhow, it is, right? Yeah. Um, anyhow, I, um, there was a, a scene where I, I, one day I just sort of figured out how to put it all together in one final big, you know, bam, mm -hmm. but also have the squee. And that was really fun to write. I, there's a scene um, where I think Jesse confronts her dad and they sort of have a little bit of a heart to heart. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that was really f- not fun is not the right word, but um, emotional and interesting to write for me. Other, the banter is always a joy. I mean, I love writing banter. Um, I mean, tell me three things sort of encapsulates like my philosophy in life in the sense that I love I love the idea that we're ex- watching someone experiencing two major firsts, right? Their first loss, but also their first love. And sometimes in life, like the best and the worst things happen at the same time. Um, and so I wanted to sort of have the reader feel that. I want them to cry, but I also want them to laugh. And I find that I am funniest at my lowest moments. Like when things are darkest, that's when I become my most hilarious self <laughs> because you don't lose the humor just because things are bleak, right? And so I wanted to sort of write about those ups and downs um, and sort of give the reader the same ride. I definitely know what scene you're talking about at the end of the diner. That, I will never forget that scene. That is probably <laughs> one of my favorite scenes I've ever My heart walked. was pounding when I yeah. read it the first time. I was, I was like, like oh my God. And then when, okay, there was just, it was just amazing. And the way that it ended, like, it was so perfect at the same time. But that brings me back to this question. Did you know who SN was gonna be from the very beginning? Or like, how did you sort of figure out who it would be? So I, I am a pantser in the sense that I write by the seat of my pants. I'm not a plotter. But for this book, I had to know who SN was from the second I sat down to write. And the reason is I needed to make their voices consistent because we needed to meet them in real life and then we needed to meet them on the page. And I had to have their experiences and who they are match or at least be filtered through the medium in which they're communicating, right? I mean, as we were just discussing, people are different in person than they are on the page. Mm -hmm. And so if there was gonna be a disconnect, it had to be a conscious one. I couldn't just write these two cute characters who I liked and then made them the same person at the end. There there had to be a consistency. Um, So I did know who SN was throughout. Um, After maybe like my fifth draft, I went back and did more red herrings and sort of to to heighten the mystery. and to add sort of these moments where you're like, wait, is it so-and-so? Is it so-and-so? Just to, you know, make it more fun for the reader. But from day one, I knew who SN was. And that was really important. I don't think I could have written this book any other way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I read the book, I did not really realize who SN was. I think it was, I did. I think it to like the last 50 pages. And like, I love mystery thrillers. Like I usually read that like on a day-to-day basis. But for this, I couldn't figure it out. Like I was just like, hey, love. And then... Liam, and then it was just like so crazy, but what little clues did you put like maybe in the beginning that kind of led to it being Ethan? So I, um, I didn't, I didn't intentionally seed clues for SN. Instead, I seeded clues for not SN because I knew they were the same character. I would, I hoped that the consistency of voice and connection would be the thing. I mean, I wanted, I very clearly wanted the reader to root for a certain person, right? Um, Because I felt like, I mean, there's nothing more disappointing in a rom-com when the two people you're hoping get together don't actually get together. I mean, there's certain conventions of the genre that I think are really important. And if you're gonna break the conventions, you have to know you're breaking them. And I didn't wanna break that convention. I mean, it's my favorite thing of the rom-com is that you know from the beginning that you're gonna get this particular ending where these two people end up together. And there's gonna be a journey on the way there and it's gonna be emotional and hard and all this other stuff and funny, um, but you know you're gonna land in a safe place. Um, And actually during this pandemic, all I've been reading are rom-coms because of that, because I know we're going to land somewhere where I'm going to be comforted because I need comfort right now. Yeah. Um, So because I knew who SN was from the beginning and I and I purposely made them a character and a connection with Jesse that the reader would root for, it wasn't hard. I didn't have to put too many clues there. Instead, the thing that was more challenging was putting the clues that led people astray. Mm-hmm. And so, and though, you know, I mean, I don't think there are moments where you're like, is it going to be who I hope it's going to be? And I, I, and I wanted that anxiety for the reader, but I also expected them to have someone they were rooting for and hoping in the end, they'd get what they wanted. And then they were, they did. They did. They I did. did. I was like, 
oh, I was so happy about the choice you made. I was so happy. It was the perfect way to figure out who it was. But the thing for me that I figured out it was Ethan was because he called her Holmes and no one else did. And SN called her Holmes. And that was the first thing that like clicked in my mind. I'm like, okay, like this is the only person that she knows that calls her by her last name. So like, it has to be him. And I love that by the way. In any book or movie, I love when the love interest calls them by their last name. Like that's just like a little, little trope I love. And when I read it, I was like, towards the end, I was like, okay, now it has to be Ethan. Like, come on. Like, and then when, when Liam showed up to IHOP, I was like, oh no. I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, like, can't be it. <laughs> but it all worked out in the end. So I was very happy. So I do occasionally hear from Liam Shippers, people who are like, I wanted it to be Liam. And I'm oh, like, really? how could you want it to be Liam? <laughs> I don't understand. But there are people out there. So I'm curious, what is your favorite book that you have written? Oh, favorite book I've written. That's sort of like asking me to pick my favorite child. Um, I don't know, you know, it's, when I wrote What to Say Next, which is the book I wrote after Tell Me Three Things, I would have said that was my favorite. But now I've written a whole bunch of books since then and I don't know. Maybe it always is the book you're writing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I do think from like sort of the publishing author angle, it's important to be invested in whatever you're doing now and publishing works so slowly that like, we're talking about a book right now that I wrote five years ago. And my last book, which I will um, obnoxiously promote, Admission, <laughs> <laughs> came out this year. And already I'm talking about Admission pretty much all year long, but my head is in the book that's coming out in spring 2022, which is called Year on Fire. And so You're on Fire is currently my favorite book, which is also actually set at Wood Valley where Tell Me Three Things and Admission are set. All three books oh are my set. Gosh. That was actually gonna be one of my questions is if you're gonna do another like book set at the school. Oh my gosh, oh I'm yes. so happy. Yeah, so I was writing Year on Fire when the college admission scandal broke. And so I put that book aside to write admission because I was just so obsessed and deeply embedded in the college admission scandal. I felt like I, I had to write this book. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing the college admission scandal, it was so obvious that if I was gonna write a book about a, a fictional college admission scandal, it had to be set at Wood Valley, mm -hmm. which is this fancy pants LA Valley High School. Like it, it just made so much sense that that's where this kind of thing would happen. Um, and so that's how the second Wood Valley book came about. And then I went back to You're on Fire after admission, after I was done with admission and was already set at Wood Valley. And so it will be my third book set there. And what's interesting is I feel like Tell Me Three Things is a fish out of water story. Admission is a fish in water story. And You're on Fire is both. We have, we have elements of both in there. Is it a rom-com? Is it a mystery? Like, and now I'm curious. It's not a, it's not a mystery. There are two love stories. So it's a sort of a double rom-com, um, but it does have serious undertones also. I think it, it more closely mirrors Tell Me Three Things than any of my other books, but it doesn't have the mystery element. Oh, sort of I'm a, so excited. It has, it's third person, four main characters. It's sort of a larger landscape mm -hmm. than, than any of my previous books. I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to spring 2022 now. Yeah, well, as soon as I have an advanced review copy, I will send it to you guys, I promise. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was gonna ask, like, what are you gonna work on next? So after you're on fire, are you gonna take a break? Or are you gonna do another book set in Wood Valley? What's, what's your plan? I don't have a plan. I am working on a secret project that has not been announced yet. So I'm not really allowed to talk about it, but it's for a different age group than I've ever written for. That will be my big hint. Um, and that is a series. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm kind of toying with a new YA idea. I'm kind of toying with an adult idea. Um, I don't know. You know, this pandemic has, like everybody, has thrown all of my, there's so, like you make a plan and God laughs is the expression, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, we'll see. I, I, I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> is there, is there, can I say I don't know in any other way? <laughs> I just said it like 15 times. I don't know. So what that is was the day to day writing process? So I will tell you more about my pre pandemic day to day writing process because my pandemic life, as I've mentioned, is a dumpster fire <laughs> and um, there's nothing to be learned from it <laughs> other than like it's just the mess. But pre pandemic, I used to rent an office space, a writer space that was like four blocks from my house. Um, 
And so I would get my kids off to school, my mom and I got, would get my kids off to school and then I would exercise and then I would walk to work. Um, and then I would sit in this sort of writer space, which was basically just access to a desk um, that had in a place that had Wi-Fi and a clean bathroom and coffee, which is essential. essential. Um, and I, I like a fridge um, and other writers working quietly. Um, and I would go there for maybe eight hours a day. Um, you know, I'd take a lunch break. I would mess around on the internet quite a bit, um, but I would set these blocks of time where I would write. Um, and I use freedom, you know, the freedom app where they can block the internet mm -hmm. uh, to sort of force myself to focus. So I would do it like 45 minute stints and I would write. And one thing I do do that I think is helpful to aspiring writers um, as a tip for me, and it may not work for everybody, but it does work for me, is that when I sit down to write, I always go back to what I've written the day before and edit. And then as I edit, I sort of get into the material. And so when I start writing, it's almost natural. And I don't even notice that I'm starting to write the book um, because it sort of merges with the process of editing, um, which sort of makes the blank page way less scary. And then it also makes my first drafts way cleaner because they've been edited at least once. And then that's it. I mean, then I spend some part of my day doing, you know, the business of being a writer, you know, being a writer is a small business. Um, and so, you know, I answer emails and scheduling and all that stuff, promotion, you know, the businessy side of stuff, which I'm not very good at. Um, and that's it. That, I mean, that's really my, my day-to-day -day schedule in normal times. In current times, it's literally like any snatch of time I can get. I run upstairs and hide and lock my door and hope no one asks me for a snack. <laughs> So I like to ask every author that we interview for this channel, how do you deal with writer's block if you do experience it? Yeah, I mean, I think the very first thing um, is not to call writer's block writer's block, right? Because there are two kinds of writer's block. There's writer's block, which is a real phenomenon where you're fundamentally blocked as a writer for maybe years at a time. Um, that is a mental health issue, right? Where you should probably go see a therapist. But day to day, writer's block is just part of the process. Like when you're writing a book, there are many times when you don't know what happens next or the writing doesn't come well, or you're just having a bad writing day and that's built in. And to sort of pathologize it or make it something much bigger than it is and sort of create this emotional reaction to what is a normal thing um, is dangerous. And so if I'm having a bad writing day, I'm just having a bad writing day. Like it's not writer's block. It's not some bigger phenomenon. It's just today, it's just not flowing. Um, and I think changing that narrative for your brain helps because if I say I'm having writer's block, then all of a sudden I won't be able to write for a week as opposed to an afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Then there's also just like when you're writing and things aren't, you just don't know what happens next, which is something different than writer's block. That's, this is literally part of the process, right? Like sometimes you're like, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do next. I have no idea. I'm done. Right. And then I think there's two ways to sort of deal with it. There's either you focus really hard, like take a long walk and let your brain sort of process. Or sometimes a long shower helps for me too, or a long drive where like my brain is occupied with some activity that doesn't really require my mind, like driving or walking. Um, and then I force my brain to really think past the point of comfort to sort of unravel whatever knot I'm facing in the, in the manuscript. And that usually helps, but sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, sometimes I'll take a day or two away um, and do anything but think about the book, you know, watch movies and play with my kids and, you know, do other stuff, do yoga, whatever. Um, and sometimes it just sort of unlocks in the back of my brain and out of nowhere, the answer will come. Um, and then I think the final thing is sometimes if neither of those things work, it's to go back a little bit in your book and see if you took a wrong turn. Because sometimes the answer is in the chapter before where you've led yourself somewhere that there's no place to go. And then you're like, oh, I need to unravel and lead us a different way. And that can fix it. No, that's some really good advice. But my final question for you is, what advice do you have for aspiring writers out there who are just like, you know, I'm scared to start typing or I'm scared of what other people will think of my writing skills or my books. So what advice do you have for those people out there? So I was not, I never self-identified as a writer until I wrote my first novel. I mean, I didn't study English in college. I was terrified. Um, and I read all my, my 
my roommate was a English major and I read all of the books on her syllabus. So obviously I was fascinated, but terrified. And I was a lifelong reader. And I do think there's something to the fear holding us back as writers. And I think the answer is you, you're not supposed to be good when you first start. It doesn't matter what you get on the page. The point is getting words onto the page and li literally sitting your butt down and writing. I think you need to read. I think you need to read everything you can get your hands on. And I think you need to read differently. I mean, I do think there's reading as a writer and reading as a reader. And there's something to be said for switching that brain. Um, and what I mean by that is when you read as a, a writer, you look to see how someone pulls it off. Um, and if, if a book is engaging you, you ask why. And if it's not, you ask why. Um, and you sort of dissect what the writer is doing. So every book is a masterclass in writing for you. Um, and it's a free masterclass, right? There's these things called libraries. You can get any book in the world and learn from them, which is amazing. So the first thing I would say is read like a writer, not like a reader, and also just write and stop expecting to be perfect the first time around. I mean, tell me three things went through, I don't know, a hundred drafts before you see it. Um, and the first draft was garbage, I'm sure. Um, but it was garbage with potential and anything you write is garbage with potential. And so I think lessening the pressure you put on yourself and just writing for the sake of writing is really important. It's like anything else, right? Like when you first time you play tennis, you suck at it. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to hold a racket, right? And I then you suck at it. <laughs> yeah, well, I still suck at it too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, that's some really good advice though. I'm going to use it. I'm gonna Especially use it. with my college stuff, like just turn my phone off, get that app, clean yeah. up, and just yeah. do the work. <laughs> It, I mean, honestly, I know it sounds ridiculous, but the Freedom app is life changing because not only does it block the internet, but it teaches you how often you go to the internet. Mm -hmm. Because even when it's blocked, I'll click over and I'll be like, I can't believe I just clicked over five times in the last three minutes, even though it's blocked. Like it's, it's embarrassing. It shows your addiction, basically. Yeah, I'm a procrastinator. Like, I hate to say it, but that's one of my mom's pet peeves about me. <laughs> about NPR, <laughs> I mean, like, I. I'm not a major procrastinator, but like I do, like, especially when it comes to writing, I do. Like I, I also procrastinate my feelings. It's like, if I'm nervous about something, I'm like, I'm gonna procrastinate my feelings of nervousness until right before I do the thing. <laughs> like I'm one of those type of people. I just don't want to think about it. So I'm definitely gonna try that out. It's yeah, I mean, maybe you're, maybe you're processing your feelings in the procrastination. Like I'm, maybe you're holding them off until you're ready for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm going to use that next time. <laughs> my mom asked me why. I'm like, okay. Oh, this is a good one. What is your biggest pet peeve when writing a book? Mm. Reading a book? Uh, See, I don't have my glasses on. I can't, <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> oh, no, it says reading a book. Yeah. Did I say writing or reading? Writing. <laughs> you asked the question then. Okay. What is your biggest pet peeve when reading a book? Oh, this is a good one. Um, when there's an idea or an expression I've already written, which tells me my thoughts on original. Like there's certain things that everyone, it's sort of in the zeitgeist that we all use as expressions. And when you see it in print from someone else, you're like, oh, I can't believe I made that mistake too. And we all do. I mean, it happens to every writer. Kind of like the, she released a breath she didn't realize she was holding. Exactly, yeah. that's, the, that's the exact example. That is, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I reread uh, Tell Me Three Things not too long ago, and I have one of those in there that she releases a breath she doesn't know she's holding. And I read it and I cringe with my entire body. <laughs> like, ah, how could I do that? So do you read your book reviews online? I do at first. So when a book, so with most books, the advanced review copy comes out first. Um, and then, you know, the sort of the answer, like review, not answers, the reviews come up on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. And those first round of reviews I do read just to sort of see how the book is being received generally. And I do read my trade reviews. Um, but after a certain point, especially once the book comes out, I stop looking. Like I, I've already had a sense of like the tone that has been set and whether people are enjoying it or they're not. Um, and then I feel like there's not much more to be learned from them. And also the book doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the world. Was this supposed to be lightning round that I'm going along? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not good at lightning rounds. So what made you want to go from being a lawyer to an author? I hated being a lawyer. Um, I was a very miserable lawyer. And on Sunday nights, I'd cry about having to go to work on Monday morning. And as part of a New Year's resolution, I quit my law job to write my first book. 
to be clear, first of all, no one should ever quit their job to write a book. It's a really, really <laughs> stupid thing to do. But my thinking was I was gonna write this book because it was something I wanted to do before I died, like a bucket list thing. In the meantime, I'd figure out what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. Um, it just so happened that it like writing worked in this like magical, organic way. And I found an agent and got a publishing deal and sort of, I was able to make it work. Um, I was, I mean, it was a huge, huge amount of luck um, that made that happen and sort of, I became a writer and that was probably, I don't know, 14 years ago. And I've never looked back. Um, I, don't, I don't miss my lawyering days at all. So how do you plan a plot twist? <sighs> um, I don't, I don't plan. Um, I mean, I know that there are plenty of writers who do, who have these outlines and they know what's gonna happen. Um, I don't, and it, it sort of sometimes surprises me as much as anyone else. So when I'm writing, I'm writing along and, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh wait, this is what happens next. Cool, I didn't know that. And and it's just as much a surprise to me as it is to the reader, which is why being a pantser is fun. Um, I mean, on the other hand, being a pantser stinks because you never know what's gonna happen and it's really stressful. But um, yeah, I, so I don't know. The answer is I don't know what, I'm, I don't plan a plot twist. I mean, later I will go back and edit to make it more seamless. Mm -hmm. And especially if it needs seating earlier on, um, but yeah, it takes me as much as, as by surprise as everyone else. Like the ending of Tell Me Three Things, that was not planned. It just came to me one day and I was like, this is the ending. Like, oh, there it is. So who was your favorite author? And if so, what is your favorite book from them? My favorite author is Zadie Smith, whose work I love. And I love both her novels and I love her um, nonfiction work. She just recently released an essays, a collection of essays about living through the pandemic called Intimations, and it's brilliant and beautiful. And she's the only person I would trust to sort of synthesize what we're going through while we're going through it. Um, so I will read anything by Zadie Smith. Um, but I have a million favorite authors. Like I, there's some people I love in YA. I, I, I don't know. I, my, my reading taste is all over the board. I want to just read them all. I want to read every single book. My goal in life in the future is to have a big library in my house. Mm -hmm. That's something I want in my future home. Me too. I, I mean, I have a ton of books in my house, but I don't have like a built-in bookshelf. And I want like a big, beautiful built-in, and I want one of those like sliding ladders. Yeah, <laughs> like um, kind of like Beauty and the Beast. With yeah, I was just say like Belle and Beauty and the Beast, exactly. <laughs> like I'll be wearing my yellow dress and it'll fly behind me. So where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh my God, <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I mean, I think my life will be fundamentally different because in 10 years, my kids will be either out of the house or leaving the house, which is just devastating for me to think about. Um, but I think I'll be doing exactly the same thing. I mean, I think I'll be writing. I don't know if I'll be writing YA. I mean, I don't know exactly what I'll be writing, but I can't imagine my life shifting in a way in which writing is not no longer my outlet because I'm very lucky that I've been able to combine my passion with my job. Um, and I need it. Like when I'm in between books and not writing, I'm miserable. Like I, I need the process of writing. Um, so I imagine I'll be in a little room somewhere writing. Um, hopefully I'll be able to have an office somewhere. My office that I've been writing pre-pandemic closed. Um, and so I need to find a new one, which is, you know, very upsetting. But yeah, I don't know if my life will be that different. Um, or at least I hope it's not that different. I think I'll have more gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little Botox. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll see it. <laughs> than that. Yeah, tell me three things was turned into a movie. Who would you cast as a character? Oh, that's good. That's a good one. Ooh, that's a tough one. I don't know. Um, I don't, I'm not great with like who's around. My daughter loves Olivia Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think she would be phenomenal. Um, you guys would be great. <laughs> no, I have no idea. No. I'm not really, I, I, those are like the three, you guys are the three actresses I know. <laughs> you know, it'll be great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. I hope you enjoy your vacation. You definitely deserve it. And if you guys have not gotten it already, what are you waiting for? Go get Tell Me Three Things by Julie Buttsbum. Thank you so much for coming on today. It was lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to talk to you guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Of course. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.